Okay. Okay. Good. Yes. So you know when I okay. So uh, I will speak about linear sigma model. and quasi-maps. And uh, then I'll write down the formula for correlation of observables in and now the question is how to call it. I would call it You see, unfortunately, Due to lack of understanding between physicists and mathematicians, terminology is kind of obscure. So when I'll call this model in its physical name, as it's called in physics, mathematicians would not understand what I'm talking about. If, <laughs> if I call it uh, in mathematical terms, physicists would not understand what I'm talking about. So, so I'll call it C n plus one over C star model, such that physicists would see that it is a model containing of n plus one charged uh, matter fields. And the, and the gauge group is U1, and mathematician would see that this is a theory of maps to Cn plus 1 divided by the action of the C, of the C star, okay? Still, people need to find the common language. So I thought uh, what to start with. So previously, we studied this phenomena from the, I would say, mathematical point of view. We considered quasi maps, you see, quasi implies that they are not actually maps. And we saw why they are not actually maps. It's because at some region in this space, it is not a map. And the example I'll just recall was that if you consider this map, when A equals to B and Z equals to A simultaneously, it is not a map. <coughs> So this quasi was uh, put in by Greenfield and uh, he thought he is smart, okay? Saying that it is like a map, but not really a map. At the same time, would he be in even closer communication with, with physicists? He would realize that they think is nothing but Abrikosov, Nielsen, Olsen, Wardex. So would he know it? He would say that, that these are vortices, but uh, he was not in proper connection with the proper group of physicists because Abrikosov was not even doing high energy physics. 
he was doing solid state solid state physics. However, and you know Nielsen, I thought it's the great Nielsen from uh, Denmark, who is uh, called by his compatriots academician, because he is very original and knows a lot of things in different fields. So, <clears throat> and uh, we already described this, this quasi map somehow, they form a space C N plus one, D plus one over C star. Okay, we take out zero, <coughs> quasi maps. What I'm going to explain right now is the following. What would happen if we look at this mathematical object? First, from the point of view of gauged linear sigma model. And then we will proceed with computations here. So the problem, the, let us put it this way. The problem is posed by physics, the solution is given by mathematics, right? So today I want to take this path. It means that remembering what quasi maps are, we should look a bit on gauge linear sigma model. Here we also may have two different uh, philosophic point of views, okay? Depending on the point of view, you will consider something main and something uh, on the top of it. <coughs> So gauge linear sigma model is a theory where we have charged fields that I have called phi. And for simplicity today, we will consider them as abelian fields. <coughs> so for physicists, these fields uh, <coughs> correspond to matter. So this is the main thing. However, there is, they are charged, okay? And they could be coupled to gauge field. And uh, today we will consider it as a just U1 gauge field. So, <clears throat> When you say gauged linear, if you stress on linear, you stress on the fact that it is about matter, but with gauge coupling. You may also have a different look at it. And the different look is you stress on gauge. So when you stress on gauge, you would say no. It's basically about the gauge theory. And then uh, this matter is something that we add to it. Okay? Um, it happens that different philosophy leads to different uh, views on what is important, what is not important here. Okay? Now, I know that uh, I with uh, Pavel and Donald were studying gauge theory, right? In two dimensions, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for us, maybe the gauge point of view 
would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's because I'm going to talk about uh, that we have not done in our uh, research, unfortunately. Okay? And uh, it's my fault that we did not move in this direction. So it was first introduction. Introduction number two is that uh, similarly in dimension four, we can have two points of view on the, on n equals to two super young meals. One of the point of view is that we are dealing with instantons, okay? And then we write down Matai Quillen a representative for instantons, okay? And actually not even for instantons, but <coughs> for a holomorphic bundle. Another point of view would be what was the point uh, started by Witten, that we are studying supersymmetric theories. And we should lead and we should be motivated by uh, by this fact, the supersymmetry first, and then where, where, it, where it is localized, where it could be localized, it's, uh, it's an extra thing. You see, these two philosophy, we will see these two philosophies here again. Uh, so now let me put a bit uh, physical philosophy, of physics, physics, sorry, not physical. I'm always, always making this mistake, mistake, physics. So, I will write down only the boson fields, bosonic fields. So, Andrei, uh, but uh, this gauge linear sigma model that we are discussing, is it a topological conformal field theory? It's a good point. There is a limit in which it is. Theory itself is not. Well, one second, theory itself. However, in the limit where the gauge, where the gauge coupling constant goes to infinity, mm -hmm. it is. And then you may argue that uh, this limit is somehow directable or Q exact Oh, we, we, we may study this. Ah. Uh, ah. Ah, hello. Okay. So, in the gauge, so, bosonic piece of the two-dimensional theory is like this. Now, let us see what happens when we couple it, couple, couple it to super young mills. Oh, Yes, of course, to 2D super young males. We started di discussing this, but uh, let me recall. <coughs> so there, there, are, there, is, there is the following modification that we have to do. First modification is that we have to add the kinetic term for uh, super young meals. In this case, it would be even super maxwell in our case. Second modif modification would be that we need to write down covariant derivative.
But this is not the all modification that are here. And actually, it's because that in this way, we will couple it to ordinary Maxwell field. When we couple it to super Maxwell field, we need to, we need to take into account that there are extra terms. so-called D terms. And you may remember that we studied them. Mm -hmm. These D terms. Mm -hmm. So let me recall. You see, now I'm speaking as a physicist, okay? So, there was a super field description. So this is the case of a billion gauge group. And here was this integral over d4 theta. And this vector multiplet that contains the gauge field had important field that was called D. It was called D not because it's a derivative. It's because somebody just uh, wanted to call uh, components like A, B, C, D, okay? Term like this. So when we plug it here, we have the following uh, interaction. Phi bar phi times D. Actually, so we need to re remember that there is also such term here. It's not all. Because it was possible, I'm sorry for, uh, it was possible to add the following term in the business. This is R times integral of V. So there is something coming from the coupling with the matter field, and there is uh, something that comes from the from the gauge theory itself. So the usual Young Mills term is where is in is it part of the second one. So you so you may so then you may ask the following question: What is Young Mills? Okay. Mm -hmm. What is Young Mills and what is uh, the coupling? So actually. You may consider this term as a pure as a pure Young Mills term because it doesn't contain anything. Of the matter. Mm -hmm. 
and plus one in our previous notations. However, at the same time, it comes in this form. So this term could be added only for a billion gauge theory. Also, for a billion gauge series, you may and should add so called theta term. So, this is a two dimensional theta term that is a two dimensional analog of the theta term that people uh, use in uh, four-dimensional Young-Mills theory. Mm -hmm. That counts the number of instantons. So we have this. We also have this. Now, what else do we have? It's interesting that that we have a term that comes without derivatives, but uh, that represents the interaction of the D field with itself, something like kinetic term for this field D. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, in, and it goes as follows. If you consider pure uh, Maxwell theory, you may consider that this term naturally comes together with this term. So I'm confused. This F squared term, is it a part of the thing that you wrote in terms of superfields or is, yes. it, is it to be added to it? Yes, it, it, it is. It is. So it's a part of the superfield expression. Yeah. Yes, it's it's a part of superfield, of course. Mm. I, so when you think about uh, terms uh, that are propagating, you may think that you will have only this term. And actually, without matter, you would not see this term at all. Mm -hmm. You may consider it as auxiliary field. You can integrate it out. However, as it happens in supersymmetry, this auxiliary field has a property to, to couple to meta fields. So you see, we are gradually building up the supersymmetric signal. Let me put it this way. You may ask, could uh, I get, could I find this D field if I just try start, if I just start doing this F minus square uh, gauged matter, okay, and I'll try to make up supersymmetry, and the answer would be yes. 
you would need to find the extra extra vertices in the supersymmetric theory from supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is easier to do it uh, starting from the superfields. Mm -hmm. So the, this is uh, invariant in the supersymmetry transformation. Yes, yes. This, is, this is invariant from the super from supersymmetry transformation. So that's what people were doing. So if you integrate out D, then this is just uh, what is it? It's a uh, it's a Higgs mechanism with the yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you if you integrate out D, you would see exactly the following. E square, I think, E square. So what minus R. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you see that this model has a uh, Higgs branch, this thing. Now, would it be only Higgs branch? It would have non-trivial topology. Having non-trivial topology, it would have its, all in, its own instantons. With having uh, its own instantons, it should have uh, the, param uh, the parameter that computes the number of instantons. And it turns out that uh, it would be this theta that would play this role. Now, now, uh, after uh, uh, now having this, we may try to do the following here. We may try to rearrange derivatives. So, uh, rearranging derivatives. we may bring it in the following form. Plus, of course, there would be some term, so when we are rearranging derivatives, coming from the curvature. Okay. Now, 
we are trying to reach so-called Bogomolny bound. We are trying to see when uh, this action has a minimum and uh, and one can do the following thing. Let us remember that two-dimensional manifold when we where we work actually had a metric. So let us let us write it down in a covariant form. So in a covariant form, here we should definitely definitely need to eat to add the square root of the determinant. So it's a measure determined by two-dimensional metric. <clears throat> Here, we don't have this thing. We also, but we should add it here. So it is kind of important. Why here is its denominator, it's clear. Here we have uh, something of dimension four. That's clear that we will get it this way. <clears throat> when I'm doing it this way, I can easily see that the charge in dimension two has dimension. In dimension four, charge is dimensionless. In physics, in two-dimensional physics, we attribute dimensions, dimensions here, so this E, always is always multiplied by the square root of g. It happens here, it happens here, and there is no e here. Well, just imagine that I am, that I am continuing uh, making what is known as the Bogomolny rearrangement. So Bogomolny rearrangement means that you take a bosonic piece of the action and we and you pick up the positive part of it. You consider it as a, as a sum of the positive terms. And then so-called Bogomolny bound is a bound where all these positive terms go to zero. So when you try to rearrange these terms together, we have something here, we have something here, we have something here. You may see that what you actually have is this. So now let me try to write it down properly, not forgetting anything. Putting the square root of G and correspondingly E square together So you can come to the following expression. I basically tried to explain the origin of terms that are coming here. So as I told you, today I'm looking at what happens from the so-called physical side, side of physics. So, I have this topological term, 
It's topological because I understand that the gauge field uh, uh, could have uh, C1s, non-trivial C1. And what I found at the end is that all these supersymmetric couplings So if, if, I, if I did not make a mistake, maybe I made a mistake, maybe there is RF term. Maybe I forget RF term. I, I don't remember right now, but basically what we have here is the following. Two positive terms. First term means that you have a holomorphic bundle and uh, n plus one holomorphic sections. And you should consider this in the infinite dimensional space as a holomorphic equation. We already dis 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 uh, uh, discussed why a bar should be considered uh, as a holomorphic variable. It's because a bar determines you the holomorphic line bundles. So this equation should be considered as, uh, or these, these equations should be considered uh, as a set of uh, al algebraic equations, holomorphic equations in the infinite dimensional space. Now, how should we or could understand these equations? This contains phi bar and phi, not holomorphic. This contains F, and F, once again, is D bar A minus D A bar in abelian case. This is non-holomorphic, this is non-holomorphic. It is squared, but we understand the meaning of it. We also discussed it before. This is the moment map for the symmetry that acts here. Interesting, yes? We started doing physics, right? When we were doing physics, we study supersymmetric theory and just we are rearranging terms. And after you rearrange terms enough, you see that what you have, and of course, so let me comment, moment map for what? It's a moment map for U1 action. So what is this U1 action? It's just gauge transformation here. First question is, what is the action? And of course, let me remind you, we discussed it, but it's good to remind that what is symplectic structure. And we know that uh, the space of variables are connections and fields. Connections are one forms, 
basically. And fields are scalars. So symplectic structure is the well-known symplectic structure for connections. And I don't put trace because uh, it's a Zabelian story. And the second thing is, of course, uh, symplectic structure for uh, scalar fields. So this is the most natural symplectic structure that can be right on the space of maps to here. You need to put the square root of metric. You don't need to put it here. So it's important to see that uh, in this two-dimensional gauge linear sigma model, we see nothing but uh, symplectic quotient. Hmm? So it is good to see that that the finite dimensional analog that the finite dimensional analog of uh, this gauge linear supersymmetric sigma model, you see these are physical terms, is f of x y equals to zero by the factorized by the action of c star to power k. You may ask why I put here x and y. I put here x and y in order to show somehow that uh, in a two-dimensional theory, there are two types of holomorphic fields. So analog of x would be phi, and analogs of y would, would be a bar. And there is a common action of system. The difference, some slight difference, is that uh, the action on a bar is uh, shifts. OK? While the action on field phi is uh, rotations. So, Andrei, uh, sorry, I'm completely lost, but uh, in pretty much everything that you are saying, but uh, why do you say that this is a symplectic quotient if uh, this equation doesn't look like the zero of a moment map? It is. Why is it a zero of a moment map? You wrote a moment map, but the equation looks like something completely different. This, I, this is the moment map. Yes, but the equation is something completely unrelated. You mean this equation? Yes. Of course. Pasha, maybe I'm going too fast. I told that the analog of this theory is not Cn over C star k. The action is hypersurface so, divided by C star Okay. So the analog of this equation I see. has nothing to do with the moment map. I see. Okay. It's a set of equations. Okay. So it's a symplectic quotient, but of a hypersurface. I see. Yes, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so it is a symplectic quotient, not of the hypersurface. It is a symplectic quotient of complete intersection. Mm -hmm. That we started from the mathematical point of view before. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's a pity that this uh, simple fact is not uh, explained in the literature. And that's basically because people who are doing supersymmetric theories do not know symplectic quotients and uh, this uh, toric geometry in particular. And people who are doing toric geometry do not know uh, anything about gauge linear sigma modules, supersymmetric. But if, so I'm trying to go slowly, okay? I said two terms. This is holomorphic equation. That is covariant. It's not invariant, it's covariant. But to be covariant is good enough. Okay? So that corresponds to a classical vacuum of the cage linear sigma model. So it depends. It depends. Uh, so at the moment, I want to make connection with mathematics. At the moment, I want to say that if we properly rewrite. So, Andrei, so, so I feel a bit disconnected from <laughs> everything that you're saying today. I'm sorry. But what do you mean in uh, covariant but not invariant? I don't understand the meaning of this phrase. And the words. OK. okay let me consider a finite dimensional example. Mm -hmm. Consider the hypersurface. Mm -hmm of degree D. Mm -hmm. Hypersurface is invariant under action of C star. Yes. However, equation itself is not invariant. Yes, it is, a, it, it is equivariant. I, I, don't, I don't know what, is, what covariant means at all. What does this word mean? OK. Covariant uh, comes from uh, physics. So yes, yes, that equivariant physicists say covariant. Okay, <laughs> so maybe I made a mistake in presentation used uh, by using. No, no, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you ask physicist, what does he think about equivariance? He would say, I don't understand what that means. Mm -hmm. If you ask physicist, what uh, does physicists think about being covariant? He says, oh, I know. But covariant. so uh, so here under U1, so you mean un under the U1 action? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so you may ask, uh, so this equation is of course equivariant under the, not U1, under the gauge U1. Other the so the group, of course the group. So okay, so this is an analog. So once again, I will erase this. This is the analogy. Okay, I even put here small f in order not to confuse with the. Uh, with the curvature. So in algebraic geometry, we know that the most interesting cases, okay, half of the algebraic geometry works with, uh, not half, some piece, I will not say half, works with the with objects of this type. Uh, complete intersections, okay. Equations, and we factorize the space of solution to these equations by C star to some K, mm -hmm. okay? So these are complete intersections. Set 
actually we know that we should better do it this way. So this slash, you need to understand what do you mean. Actually, what we do is this. So this is what I, what I say mathematics. Physicists, physicists coming from the very different motivations by studying supersymmetric theories, mm -hmm. came to the following set. Uh, came not to the following set, came to the following expression. Let me call it expression. Okay. And here, of course, in physics. Okay, I will even write it down here. One D bar plus A bar phi I equal to zero. Here I am putting here I put the moment map. And they divide by the gauge U1. Okay. Pasha. Yes. Let us see what is the analog of what. So uh, it's very hard to see on, on the very right side of the board. It's. Um... Ah, it's my fault. It's my fault because it's dark, or because of what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's kind of possible to an extent. Okay, I'll. Okay, I'll try to write it down. It's important, please. E squared, mm -hmm. square root of G, phi bar phi, minus R. Mm -hmm. Could you see what's written here? Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And here, I, I specifically put here the gauge. So what I'm telling you so is gauge one is uh, kind of symplectically generated by this by the second equation, right? Yes. So, so this is a moment map for gauge u one. So what I'm telling you, it's kind of wisdom. And this wisdom says that, that some structures of supersymmetric series have nice counterparts in algebraic geometry. Or in symplectic geometry, it depends how you consider this symplectic reduction. To make the story proper, I would put it like this. Here I put ordinary quotient. Here I put moment map. And here is single line.
So here on the right hand side, you see the complete intersection theory. In algebraic geometry. On the left hand side, you see what actually happens in the gauged linear sigma model. You see very different naming. However, you see that the right hand side is a particular case uh, that this left hand Sorry, I will call it D equals zero. I will call it D equals two. So zero dimensional case could be naturally generalized to two dimensional case. And this generalization is nothing but supersymmetric gauged linear sigma model mm -hmm. obtained from the very different uh, motivations, you see? Mm -hmm. Motivation to write down this was very different. And I started my today's talk explaining how this model appeared in physics. Mm -hmm. People actually studied matter fields In, in, in gauge theory. Then they decided to study its supersymmetric generalization because of the great uh, insight of Goldfern and Lichman in uh, 1970 that you should study not ordinary theories but supersymmetric theories. And then, wow, we see that at least bosonic piece of this supersymmetric theory is a two-dimensional analog of uh, the complete intersection. People who came to this place from mathematics call things here in mathematical terms. They call this holomorphic equation and they call this moment map. Mm -hmm. People who came from physics call this D term Okay. And uh, call this uh, coherently constant uh, call this holomorphic uh, maps. Mm -hmm. Actually, this setup <coughs> was already studied in uh, mathematics by Brill and Noether. Namely, the space of solutions to this equation is known as brill noter pair. So I forgot how to write down Brill. So I, I could make a mistake in spelling. I also hold that it is any noter. I, I have not checked it. They are called brill noter pairs. You may ask, where do, you, do I see pairs here? I see pairs here in the following place. 
D bar plus A bar is the holomorphic line bundle. And phi i is its holomorphic section. What is interesting is that mathematicians never considered it in Dalbo language. Mathematicians, of course, considered it in terms of polynomials. Not in terms of Dalbo, because when they were doing this, Dalbo was not Dalbo language and languages of smooth things was not popular. So, so, so what do you mean in term, so, so what do you mean in, lang in the language of polynomials? How so? Okay. So there, is, there was a great work of uh, of Sell mm -hmm. called Ga Gaga. Mm -hmm. Geometry analytic, geometry analytic, and geometry algebraic, or mm -hmm. said that what people studied in uh, algebraic geometry, at least something, some, some of what people studied in algebraic geometry, could be reformulated in terms of analytic geometry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember the time where it appeared. I thought it in sixties. Mm -hmm. Something around 66, but I may be wrong. So before that paper, people were doing algebraic geometry in a different way. It was about polynomials. There were no smooth functions there. Polynomial equations, solutions, uh, modulus, modulus. Sure, sure, but you're you're saying that this this pair was considered in terms of polynomials. So yeah. also, yes. yes. So so this pair was considered in the following uh, way, in the following setup. People people studied line bundles on the Riemann surfaces. Mm -hmm. For them, they were just curves, on algebraic curves. So they studied line bundles on algebraic curves. These files were studied as uh, their holomorphic sections. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they studied the pair, the pair line bundle and the set of its holomorphic sections. That's why it's called a pair, two, two pieces. So after uh, Serre. We call one piece a bar, and we call another piece phi. Because in geometry analytic, these two things are functions. Mm -hmm. For people uh, before the Second World War, they were objects from algebraic geometry. namely line bundle and uh, holomorphic section. So how, how do they understand line bundles? So there were several ways to describe it. I don't, rem I don't know which, uh, what, uh, which way did they choose, but you may think of line bundles by uh, its divisor. So it was a curve and a set of points. Uh, with numbers, with uh, integer numbers. So this was line bundle. Mm. So holomorphic sections. So what was holomorphic section? So holomorphic section was uh, a section of this line bundle that had no poles. You see nothing smooth there. Everything purely algebraic. Mm -hmm. And of course, in this way, they could study it over any field. But it appeared before the Second World War. So this modification or this interpretation 
of these brown motor pairs comes after uh, Gaga. When we understand that holomorphic line bundle is could could be equivalently represented by uh, connection, and holomorphic section is nothing but uh, holomorphically covariant uh, section. So now we understand this. So bring neuter pairs in the language of analytic geometry. Old problem in the new language. And now we see that this old problem in the language of analytic geometry actually appears in the gauged linear sigma model. And here is the moment map. And this is, uh, I think, 70s. So what people start to study symplectic reductions. Mm -hmm. And all this is uh, a bosonic piece of uh, gauged linear sigma model. OK? So why I'm spending time on this? Because each particular fact is known, OK? I'm just putting it together because I have some uh, advantage. I can see different things, and I can put them together. Each, uh, I just see the full picture. Each link was known. But people who discovered uh, Abrikosov, uh, Nelson, Olsen, uh, something, vortices, had no idea how this is, how, how, how supersymmetric version of it is related to brilliant neuter pairs. Because of course, when you, when you look at brilliant neuter pairs, you study not just solutions to this equation, but of course, solutions to this equation moduli the proper action. Mm -hmm. In brilliant neuter case, they of course uh, factorized by C star and maybe studied some stability condition. OK? So that is what gauged linear sigma model is. That is what supersymmetric gauged linear sigma model is. Because when people started doing this sigma models, they were not thinking about supersymmetry. They were mostly thinking about uh, Higgs phenomena. For them, these phi's I don't know which fields do they consider, like electrons. So it came from the solid state. Mm -hmm. Where do we have this? You have electrons uh, in the Maxwell field. I, th I think it was the uh, the old landau ginzburg model, right? The non-supersymmetric one, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. So I want to conclude this discussion by the following remark. I already made this remark, but uh, I think that I have to do it again and again because uh, in mathematical physics community, people do not know it, you see? People know it in solid state community. People know it maybe in high energy physics, but not in mathematical physics community. 
And this remark is as follows. that this thing should be that we would like to consider case e square going to plus infinity. Okay, people in mathematical physics community know this. It is the favorite limit of Edward Witten for young Mills, right? Sorry, sorry. Even I made a mistake here. Ah, to zero. To zero. So this term dominates. So now we need to see what the moment map is. You see, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to be mistaken here. Because uh, Let us see what is interesting. You see, I, I, I want to I want to think how to explain this. First of all, remember, I would like to say the following. Remember that the, that the dependence on E square when we, when we considered moment map was exact, okay? You remember that we studied this, okay? Mm -hmm. We studied this two talks ago, mm. all right? So there will be concentration on flat connection. Yes, yes. So, so you see. So, so you may, so you may think that you concentrate on flat connection. However, as you know, connection could not be flat because it has C1 of L not equal to zero, okay? So the case that is impossible here is so what is not possible? F equal to zero is impossible, okay? Because we need to, so, so what is not possible? F equal to zero, phi, phi bar phi equals to R together is not possible. Because we need integral of F be non-zero. Okay. You add some dimension. So, so it means that we need to look at different configurations. We need to look at configurations where F 
is not zero. Okay? So you may ask, uh, what are these configurations? Or where flux is concentrated? So flux is concentrated exactly in the region where, so we have flux where where this is not zero. Okay. Moreover, one can show studying this that phi should inevitably pass zero. So this thing should go through zero. And in this case, you have vortices. Uh, sorry, I, I, I don't understand any of those claims. Okay. For instance, for instance, why why do you say that that first churn class is necessarily non-zero? Are we are we is this a sudden input in the model that that we are considering only non-trivial line bundles? Yes, it is an input of the model that you consider non-trivial line bundles. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's an input. I, I said that, that what is not possible to have uh, this zero and this zero is not possible because integral of f is not zero. So this is not possible. Okay. But so are you saying that that trivial line bundle is prohibited or that we just should consider different line bundles? What are you saying here? No, no. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. So, what is not possible for non-trivial line bundle? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. This solution. So you may look. You may think. Okay, I can solve it. Mm -hmm. F equals to zero. This equals to zero. Mm -hmm. But if line bundle is non-trivial. Now, this is prohibited. So what should be? So what should happen? The thing that should happen would be the following. <clears throat> These terms should be equal, but uh, not uh, equal to zero separately. Let me rewrite this equation that this is zero in the following way. Actually, I'm a bit confused. We are considering the limit e going to zero. So should we just not ignore the, the first bracket then? The, we cannot ignore the first bracket. So 
So, so, uh, uh, so it depends. So, uh, so now we can look at this expression in different limits. Okay. Yes. So now let us. Uh, okay, maybe the best thing to do would be just to make a break, break right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Because this will take some time. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I spoke over one hour from my. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, it is clear that we need to make breaks. Yes. So without breaks, uh, uh, brains are uh, brains is not fresh, right? Yes. So, how long, how long is the break? Seven minutes. Seven, seven minutes. Okay. Seven. Uh -huh. More than five because I spoke a long and not ten because we are short in time. Okay. Right, let's do seven. Sounds good. Sounds good. Mm -hmm.
Okay, I'm back. So during the break, I realized that phenomena that I was going to explain should be explained a bit differently that, that I was expecting, OK? And, um, and it is that uh, here in this expression, Pasha, are you here? I am, yes. Mm -hmm. We have the double role of E. So when we started from physics, we see that there is E square here and E square here. Mm -hmm. However, from the mathematical understanding of what is going on, their role seems to be different. Okay. No, it's a shrinking of some region around this uh, minimum, right? So, so let me propose. So I have not checked it, but I am pretty sure that that's how it should be treated. Unfortunately, it was not treated like this in literature, and even it was not even treated like this in my paper with uh, Nikrasov and Shatashvili. But now I see how, how one should treat it. We should treat this piece in the following way. We should consider two E's. In physics, E should be equal to E tilde in supersymmetric physics. Mm -hmm. Because it is uh, what happens. Supersymmetric theory gives us a representative of some uh, class. However, to understand what actually is going on, we should better consider uh, other representatives. So this phenomena, that there should be two couplings. Actually, so where, where, where have we seen this? We could see this in uh, in nonlinear sigma model. Where uh, the same coupling naively measures uh, the degree or uh, is generating parameter for the degree of the map and for uh, how far the map is from holomorphic map. We also see this phenomena in n equals two, d equals four super young mills. That supersymmetric theory gives a particular representative and uh, it would be better to see what is going on. So uh, based on this analogy, I conjecture right now that the proper formula should be like this. And E equal to E tilde is uh, the standard supersymmet supersymmetric realization. So when we see this as a moment map, so we we should we should treat it this way. This to treat this as a moment map, and this factor as uh, 
as a localization to the zero of the moment map. And we know that in the proper theory, these are two different phenomena. We can write down Matau Quillen representative for uh, different E tilde. However, this E is inside the moment map. You see the novel phenomena that we meet here that we haven't met before is that the moment map depends on the metric. Okay? So let me study separately the issue of what happens with the moment map and separately how to localize to zero of moment maps, of moment map. So first of all, I put my moment map to zero, okay? And then I understand that the integral of f should be d. So what could I say from this? Two things. Let me call this deviation from nonlinear DFM. Okay. So in nonlinear model, this is zero. So what we see that E square square root of g, dfn, this integral equals to d, okay? Since the integral of, of curvature equals to d. So that's what we, that's what we conclude. However, we may consider here the limit E square going to plus infinity. So we will say that the wasn't it zero? What? Wasn't the E squared supposed to be zero, going to zero? Once again. So here is E, so here is it, it will be. Mm -hmm. We may consider different limits. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. sure. So, uh, sure. So, that, so there, there is a limit when e square is going to plus plus infinity and then we will consider the opposite limit is the limit e square going to infinity we see that the area where dfn is not zero 
is of the of order of one over e squared. You may say, what does it mean non-zero? So let me call it moduli more than one half. Okay. So it means that in this limit, when E is going to plus infinity, the area where this happened is very small. But we can but even on the limit E square going to infinity, we cannot have DFN equal to zero everywhere. Otherwise, we could not satisfy this condition. So, so what it means? It means that, okay, DFN has small area. Here is sigma, and here is small area where DFN is greater than one half. Now, look at this equation. Curvature F or magnetic field is concentrated exactly in this area where DFN is this. So magnetic field is concentrated in this area. So we have phenomena that has a known in physics, and I forgot the proper reference, that magnetic field is concentrated in this region. That's how it goes. In the limit E square going to plus infinity. So we have the picture. So what is the picture that we have? That outside, outside this region, we have uh, the Higgs phase, okay? This. So outside this region, we have uh, what you would like to call nonlinear sigma model outside these regions. However, inside these regions, we are far from, from this nonlinear sigma model. Magnetic field is not fixed, or gauge field, in particular magnetic field, is not fixed. It is alive, okay? And it is concentrated here. Now we may consider another limit. E square going to zero. <coughs> In the limit E square going to zero, the area where DFN is greater than one half either wants to be infinity or if we have a finite area, it means that this, ob that this object is big. It's another uh, regime. <coughs> so we can, we can, we have two regimes, okay? The thing that we hope 
we, we know is that answer should be the same. Um, so, so could you say again what happens as e squared goes to zero? When e squared goes to zero, mm -hmm. the area where dn is greater than one half because of this. Yes. Wants to be very big. Mm -hmm. However, the surface could have a constant volume. Yes. <laughs> so this is uh, realized by this DFL going to infinity. <coughs> so it is another regime. Now, basically, we expect that when you that when we study topological theory, this gives the same. You know, unfortunately, now I have to stop here for today mm -hmm. because I feel a bit tired. I'm sorry. Mm. But this is the point that I made. And uh, also, next time, I'll explain this game of two charges, E and E tilde, mm -hmm. and the topological property out of it. Now, I just want to see, to show the following. <clears throat> How can we get this phenomena just by studying these equations? In a very simple way. Let us go to the algebraic description. In algebraic description, phi's are nothing but polynomials of degree d. And polynomials of degree d should have zeros. Okay. But at the moment, I, I have to stop here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at least I made a point. Okay. Mm -hmm. My main my main point is that this nonlinear supersymmetric nonlinear sigma model should be considered as a complete intersection. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this model, its cohomology, whatever, should be treated as an infinite dimensional analog of complete intersection. And this point uh, is not made strongly in the literature. As far as I know. OK, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you very much. So being able to, to talk so, about questions. OK. Dong, I think you want to make to ask question. No, not really. Uh... So still for me, it feels like a very physics-y. So I think I wait until tomorrow's lecture to ask you a proper question, I think. Yes, but you see, I tried to make this so-called physics uh, understandable for mathematician. Oh, yes, true. I can see that that comes from this real nether pairs and some sort of moduli spaces will going on behind that. But a uh, bit bit unsure about my imagination so okay. I'll postpone it for tomorrow until tomorrow okay. Okay, thank, you. Okay, thank you then uh, see you tomorrow see you tomorrow yeah. uh, so uh, Andre I have to apologize I will not be able to come for your tomorrow's lecture and I'll watch it in the in the recording I, yes. I apologize okay but you see the main message was today Mm -hmm. You see, because mm -hmm. there is an idea and uh, computations, formulas, evidences. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I was feeling a little bit lost in the, in the beginning when uh, maybe I'm not so sort of uh, comfortable yet with the, 
well, generally with, with supersymmetric uh, field theories, I guess, and with this whole mechanism of writing down some formula in terms of some complicated super multiplets and uh, extracting some, something out of it. So my message was that uh, a great piece of supersymmetry is actually algebraic ge geometrical constructions. Oh, that part looks nice. That part so, looks nice. So what is interesting in supersymmetry comes mm -hmm. from algebraic geometry. No, no that, that, that looks nice, yeah. The rest is physics. At least we have to separate algebraic geometry piece of it. Mm -hmm. That's what Edward Witten is doing all the time. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, he, he, he has no paper here. And last, last uh, word that I want to say is that, OK, both Edward Witten and us putting together with her first, forget to study Brill Netter pairs in two-dimensional young males. And this is our common mistake and failure. So Edward Witten first uh, Edward Witten missed this issue. Then I and Nikita missed this issue, namely relation to Edward Witten, to the Manchester Young Bills. Then when we were working, we also missed this issue. Mm -hmm. So maybe we will not dismiss you right now. Okay? Right. In any, in any case, this is understandable. I want to say this is understandable, no mystery. Understandable, should be understandable from both sides, from physics and from mathematics. But, so let me just ask you again, uh, and I'm sorry you already explained this, but I'm still I need a I, I need a reminder. So when you say complete intersection, do you include the quotient in the in the definition? Uh, when I say complete intersection, I mean set of equation, and then take a quotient. And then take a quotient. So uh, so it's more or less the same as a sort of a naive notion of a. Modular space. You have some equations and some symmetries. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. It, it is yes. And uh, when you have equations and symmetries, the difference between complete intersection and general algebraic manifold is that uh, general algebraic manifold is something that is locally embedded mm -hmm. by a set of equations, locally embedded. Mm -hmm. And here we want this embed. Embedding to be global, but only in the numerator before you take quotients. Yeah, of, of course, in algebraic geometry, people of course understand yes this. Okay, but in the in the denominator, you only are interested in powers of u one, or c star. Of course not. Of course not. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, when this thing would be generalized uh, to non-abelian case, we will see something like Grossmanians in the zero-dimensional stuff. Okay. Uh, similar things in uh, two-dimensional stuff, and this is uh, inevitable if you'd like to understand instantons uh, in uh, mm -hmm. four-dimensional gauge theory. So then the word intersection is, is a little bit confusing because intersection usually uh, sort of alludes to equations, just a bunch of equations, right? But here, okay. Yes, but anyway, but that's just the word. You see, you see, when algebraic geometer writes down an equation, he is rarely writing down a fine equation because he prefers to intersect something okay. in the projective space. I see. I see. I see. Okay. So uh, when when people say cubic, of course they write it projectively. Mm -hmm. So when so you, you just... say when you say intersection, you want mm -hmm. to intersect on something compact. I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. You keep in mind the intersection on the projective space or something like that, or weighted projective space. So you are doing the operations in the opposite order: first, first uh, subspace, and then tra okay, transition to whatever CP and yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that that's clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, bye. Goodbye. Bye.